Hello! Why do I even bother about lesser known game engines if Unity, Unreal or Godot are the main ones to suggest to every game developer asking about which engine to use? Perhaps because the competition is actually great for us and the amount of work and love put into the small game engines should also be appreciated. Another year passed by and I finally managed to summarize it in this video. I know it's a little bit late for it, but there's always a place for praising a good job. So here's a ticket for you to enjoy this crazy ride along 2023 with Default. <laughs> Default is a small and lightweight multi-platform game engine and editor in one box and in 2023 the default team released 11 new stable versions of the engine and editor. And for you to know, Default has a constant 4 week release cycle, but the 12th release didn't make it before holidays in December, but as this video is published later on, we already know what's in it, so we will take a brief look at all 12 releases. It would be hard to present all of the changes one by one in a chronological way because there were 70 new features and over 160 bug fixes, so instead I focused on only highlighting the most significant changes and improvements and present it in a more digestible way. I think 2024 for default marks foremost a great accomplishment for console support. First, in the middle of 2024, Default Foundation announced official support for PlayStation 4. At that point, Default already supported Nintendo Switch and now a new console was added to the list. With information about a work on PlayStation 5 port and also starting process for Microsoft consoles as well. All the tools needed to publish for consoles were available for free, but the access to the console-specific source code was only given to supporters of the default foundation with monthly donations. As you may know or guessed, later that year default announced not only full support for PlayStation 4 and also PlayStation 5, but also that the source code is now available for free too, as long as you are an approved console developer, which you have to be anyway if you want to release the game on consoles. Several new games were released on Nintendo Switch in 2023. Default also presented a lot new partnerships, some of them with significant perks for the community. For example, if you are interested in monetizing your games, you might have been interested in exclusive consultations with AdMob Ads monetization experts. The AdMob extension for Default is maintained and is updated all the time and my friend Neocortec made a video tutorial about how to integrate AdMob to your Default game. Additionally, you might be interested in the new official Iron Source extension for default. We know about the controversial Iron Source and Unity merger, but thankfully in this case it's just a community-funded external extension for default and it stopped at that point. If we are talking about extensions, thanks to the evolving default extension system, Facebook integration has been finally excluded from the engine and moved to the separate extension. And few more words about partnerships. At first, the default continues partnerships with all of its partners and when it comes to Rive, a lot of updates took place in 2023. Default added support for textured meshes, a huge leap in Rive animation toolset. Default also teased a partnership with Audio Kinetic, creators of WYs, asking about the developers who would help testing the extension. I would be very excited about this, as beside FMOD, it would be a a great tool for sound design for default games. In the same time, Default also asked the community to test the Apple Silicon version of the editor, which is now available, and people say it's fast. I don't have any Apple device, so I can't confirm it yet. It is also regarding default game engine and build tools too. I was mentioning this many times, but Default's community is actually one of its best advantages. Through the common effort of the community, Default has now also a published article in Wikipedia. Last general thing before we go to the presentation of feature was a huge partnership with Pokey, an online platform for many web games. It has been for many years one of the favorite places to publish web games for many developers creating games in Default, especially for such hit titles like Monkey Mart, or Zombie Duo, and now this evolved into a partnership of Default and Pocky. 
This means another source of income for the default developers to make it a better engine. So default is tasked now with improving performance of the web games and building new integrations specially for Pokey. Official Pokey SDK extension for default has already been updated several times. This partnership is still strong in 2024, as in recent days Pokey invited default to be with them at their booth at GDC in San Francisco. And now a part regarding the actual features and improvements of the default. From my perspective, one of the most convenient features introduced in 2023 was the ability to add the linting and code navigation in the built-in code editor. This allows you to select node completions of what you are writing from a list of available stuff and also quickly look up the official documentation, but also show workspace diagnostics, annotations and much more. Using VS Code beside the default editor was never as convenient as it should be. I still sometimes use it, but with linting I am using now mainly the built-in editor. This is not yet default and has to be enabled by putting a link to the officially released by default Lua language server in the game.project in the dependencies section and you can't forget to click project, fetch libraries and project reload editor scripts. You can then use shortcut F12 for go to the definition and shift plus F12 to find references. When you start writing any function an autocomplete list will show up and you choose one and also you can look up the documentation with control and space. Default took a significant turn regarding managing and creating resources in runtime. Previously, default was built around the idea of preparing all resources up front, so even when we wanted to create components at runtime, we would need to have a defined factory component with a predefined prototype for every instant variation we would like to create at runtime. In 2023, default started loosening up this rule and we started seeing more and more features regarding runtime creation of resources. Since 2022 we are able to create textures in runtime and now we are also able to create full atlases and buffers as well. For this check out the resource API. As of now you can create buffers, textures and atlases and you can reference many resources like buffers, fonts, atlases, textures, materials, load and release resources and many more things. When speaking about runtime manipulation worth mentioning here is also a possibility to change the prototype for the factory and collection factory components when dynamic prototype checkbox is selected. The collection count therefore can be optimized and the owning collection will use the default component counts from the game.project settings, but this allows developers to load and spawn new files for game objects and collections, which simplifies using dynamic content in our games. Following this, it's not surprising that leaf update functionality, which enables our games to use additional content after downloading and installing the game got some improvements as well. One of them is breaking because since 1.5.0 we can load and mount multiple resource archives and therefore you need to check out the new API to do it and remove the resources when needed. Atlases also received a great feature, multi-pagination which allows to more efficiently pack textures and draw images and you can set for each atlas a maximum page size to split huge atlases into pages with restricted size while still drawing all of this in a single draw call. Since 161, multi-page atlases and materials are available in GUI 2. Default also made significant improvements in order to enable great 3D game development using Default. Default is at the core a fully 3D engine but was always shining at 2D development. Nevertheless, I made two games in 3D in the Default now and I think it really has a small potential here for simple 3D games that could be developed really fast and for example focus on the web games market. The capabilities of Default goes way beyond the simple 3D games but there aren't enough examples of its power still. The PBR default example I was teasing a year ago is still being developed and uses more and more new engine and editor features for easier 3D development. Default is moving towards more GPU driven rendering techniques. Some of the features pointed out in the very very humble and short summary of 2003 by the default team are helping to achieve this goal. For example, shaders are now supporting include pragmas which enables us to write more complex shader programs or clean up the code and separate functions into multiple files or make libraries that can be used in several other shaders allowing code reusability. 
Special SPIR V pipeline, which is used for shaders, received several improvements too, and is, for example, automatically built when used with supported Vulkan backend. One of the most significant changes is adding custom vertex formats. This allows to pass custom data into vertices from a material or sprite instance, yet is different from similar in functionality vertex constants because it does not break batching, so you can, for example, expose tint or color attribute now and change it in runtime without additional draw calls, which is super useful and efficient, not influencing performance of your games. Custom vertex formats were added at first for sprite component and later on for particle effects component. Default continued adding frustum culling functionality for the next component, so to the group of sprites and particles we can now add meshes and models, so we are finally enabled to make 3D games with frustum culling. For meshes and models this is based on the sphere algorithm. In 1.6.0 a breaking change for frustum culling was introduced to add a special options to enable all six frustum planes or leave default for side planes so without near and far planes. When speaking about breaking changes, most of them affected the DMSDKs and other internal modules, so it mainly affects native extensions but enhances its usability a lot, so check out the details of each enhancement if you are interested. Default improved the GLTF model support, added support for external buffers in the GLTF and GLB formats, or added support for multiple animated nodes in a single GLTF file, which now covers cases when it's not the first model in the scene that is used for skinning. So now I can say that GLTF can be definitely suggested as the main format for 3D objects for default. We can now also create def or stencil buffers as textures for render targets, which enables us to bind them to a shader like a regular texture without the need to write the depth data to the color texture and allows us to easily create advanced lighting, shadow maps, water reflections and refractions and other processing effects or for example create free the parallax effects in 2D games with a use of those buffers. Default added support for 60-bit and 32-bit floating point textures. Just to explain it a bit, because it's a huge feature, we know that integer formats allows us to represent colors with a constant range of values, for example 0 to 255, with 8-bit integers. Floating point buffers can represent a much wider range of luminance levels, from very dark to very bright crucial for HDR imagery, which expands the capabilities for developers, particularly for complex visual effects by allowing for a wider range of color values and more precise computations. This is now supported on OpenGL S2.0 and WebGL 1.0. Finally, the built-in default render script was refactored and now uses more of the default best practices and, most importantly, does not allocate anything in the update function. I will make an update regarding this for my video explaining the default render script. Components received several new properties, for example, simple yet very useful label components have some fresh new properties like leading, tracking and line break that can be set and get in the code, so check them out in the documentation. Sprite components got a frame count property to get the currently running animation frame count. Camera component has view, projection and aspect ratio properties that you can get and set in the code. There is also an improved way of how multiple active cameras are updated in the focus stack. GUI API is enhanced with several new functions, for example for setting and getting node materials. We can now also check if the game object exists with go exists function, especially useful before deleting the game object in code and check if a file or directory is existing with sys that exists, which might be helpful for example to check if there's a save file for the game already. The editor is getting a lot of polish, both visually and regarding performance. Several features and improvements for performance and memory usage were added to the default editor to make it even more intuitive and faster. Beside mentioned linting support, we have now very useful conditional breakpoints, better filtering, improved assets viewing, more shortcuts, for example for toggling visibility of objects, quick help page and many many more. 
Same goes for the web profiler and the whole bundle processing and experience both received several new features, fixes and improvements, for example removing comments from a bundle only to speak about one and many many other things I don't even understand now. Besides features, Default fixed over 160 issues both in engine and editor and we are very thankful for constant update to the SDKs for Android, iOS, Mac being up to date with many things you wouldn't even bother, like Android 13 didn't supporting bug button anymore and instead introducing bug gesture, or package name and iOS bundle identifiers, or just updating to newer versions and architectures like engine support for ARM64 for macOS, Vulkan support, build server updates, or editor moving to JDK 17. So that default remains multi-platform and usable all the time on all supported systems. Thank you very much for your continued effort to make default better and better. Cheers to the next year and happy defaulting! Mm -hmm.